Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. This is going to be the ultimate foundational overview of the Amazon EC2 service. You'll learn the foundations of virtualization, uh, what this Amazon EC2 service is for, and how does it benefit you as a customer. The lesson I'll jump over to here in just a second is taken from my AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam course. So if you like this video and uh, want to continue your learning voyage, I encourage you to check it out. So let's jump in. Welcome back. In this video, we'll take a look at the Elastic Cloud Compute Service from AWS known as EC2. So what's this EC2 service for exactly? And how can you benefit from it as an AWS customer? Well, EC2 is the service where you'd provision virtual servers in AWS. All right, got it. But this is a foundational lesson and some of you may be asking, what do you mean by a server and uh, how can it be virtual? Well, to keep things simple, let's say uh, a server for our discussion here is just a computer that's typically made up of a combination of a uh, central processing unit, uh, some memory chips, and perhaps some uh, storage media. Uh, a server is typically needed when you need to perform some type of high performance computational work. If we think of a simple website as an example, we often interact with a number of these servers behind the scenes that process our requests. We're using our browser as a client, uh, making these requests to uh, a server or a pool of servers that receive our browser client requests it made. The servers may then take these requests and do any number of activities depending on how our web application is designed. You know, it may be simply generating some dynamic new web pages for our browser uh, to make our experience on the site more engaging or personalized. Or perhaps it's taking some information we input through our web browser, uh, you know, perhaps on a payment checkout page, that the server may receive that input data we typed in, uh, perform some checks on it, and perhaps communicate with uh, other servers to process the payment transaction uh, with our you know, financial institution or credit card company. Um, and then from there, you know, it may restore some resulting data in a database. Uh, you know, these are some basic examples, but there are endless reasons why you may need some type of compute resources for your business. Now, from our lessons early on in the course, we explored the more traditional data center approach companies took with servers. Recall doing that capacity planning, guessing game exercise, you know, uh, buying tons of expensive servers and tying up the organization's capital in the process. You know, uh, waiting for weeks to, uh, you know, get the servers, then waiting further for data center technicians to unbox, uh, install, and cable to servers with, uh, you know, networking and power connections, uh, and then test them. So we have huge upfront costs with that approach and huge delays of you know weeks to months before we can actually use the servers. Also, don't forget that whole uh, CapEx and OpEx exercise we did around the data center facilities to house all these servers as well. So long story short, it's a rather slow, frustrating, and very expensive process to add compute resources in their traditional IT data center world. So how does this Amazon EC2 service help us out then? Well. If we recall from our discussion on the shared responsibility model, we shift all this physical data center and server burden to AWS. AWS provides us its mind-boggling inventory of servers to use as customers, and we can essentially just rent the servers we need from AWS instead of having all the uh, upfront capital expense and operational heavy lifting on our shoulders. So let's take a look at how this all works a bit deeper. Now, modern servers have a tremendous amount of compute and memory capacity to them. It's pretty rare that application workloads would happen to need the exact compute and memory offered by a specific server configuration and use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's often a ton of waste occurring on these servers. The high-powered processor and high-performance RAM capacity is simply not used 100% of the time. Now, as an example, say we did some capacity calculations for our organization, and we decided we needed to buy a bunch of the latest servers, uh, each with a 40 core CPU processor and 512 gigabytes of RAM to meet our current peak workload demands and still have maybe, a, you know, say a 20% buffer, uh, you know, a safety net just in case that peak gets any bigger. Well, right away, we're wasting 20% of these expensive servers capability by simply having that buffer. Now, we bought these specific high-performance configurations of servers to meet our organization's peak low demands based on our capacity calculations. But that peak, uh, let's say, you know, 
only occurs once a day for about uh, 40 minutes, as an example. We had to ensure that we could handle that peak, but once that demand decreases, our servers sit largely idle, perhaps wasting 95% or more of that server's capabilities. Then what happens six months from now when our application changes, uh, maybe there's some code optimizations that were made to reduce the uh, compute requirements by you know, 60%. Uh, what happens if there's shifts in the overall amount of demand due to uh, loss of customers or you know, other business dynamics at play? That peak load that we expect our service to handle is now uh, half of what it was a year ago. So long story short, in the traditional IT world with buying and managing these physical servers yourself, you're more often than not left with tremendous amounts of wasted resources, and you're stuck with this expensive hardware if you get those capacity requirement guesses wrong. Now with the Amazon EC2 service, AWS uses a technology called virtualization to better utilize the physical server resources. We won't get into the low level details here, but virtualization is accomplished through specialized hypervisor software technology that interacts with the physical server hardware components to create smaller logical slices of them. The hypervisor manages the creation of these slices and can assemble them as a virtual machine. With virtualization, we can carve up the physical CPU, memory, uh, networking, and storage resources in any number of variations and we can create you know, tens or perhaps hundreds of these smaller virtual compute machine resources from the same physical server with you know, different mixes of the CPU and memory configurations if needed. The hypervisor layer works its magic to isolate each virtual machine from one another as well. So this virtual machine uh, here would have no idea that the other virtual machine exists on the same physical server. There's basically no way to interact with the other virtual machine's uh, CPU or memory slices. From within the virtual machine, you can install your own operating system and applications. And you know, from that perspective, uh, your operating system and applications would have no idea it's running on a virtual machine instead of a physical one. Now, a core reason for virtualization is that we can pack more of these smaller virtual machines onto the physical server to make better use of the physical hardware resources of that host. Now, if we start to think about this from the AWS angle, we can sort of start to understand how this service works and how it's so cost effective for us to use as customers. So AWS would have these data centers with uh, a ton of servers, and then they add this hypervisor layer to them to allow the creation of these virtual machines on top of them. Now, how does this benefit us as customers? Well, first think back to our lesson on the economies of scale. AWS has tremendous buying power and highly customized hardware and silicon chips in some cases to essentially get that raw physical server capabilities at a far lower cost than you know most organizations ever could. Then think of that server underutilization issue we just talked about. You know it's still an issue uh, with these AWS servers as well, but it's not our problem anymore. It's AWS's problem. AWS has that capital investment in this server hardware, and they want to ensure that capacity is not going to waste. So AWS pools massive amounts of these servers together for their huge customer base to use. And they're able to manage that virtualization effectively to pack customers virtual machines onto these servers and reduce that capacity waste as much as possible on these servers. So from the AWS perspective here, we have very, very cost efficient physical server hardware through the AWS buying power because of their sheer scale and volume. And then the servers are operated very efficiently, so there's very little wasted capacity. These efficiencies of AWS's scale weave all through the you know, data centers and operational overhead. This all results in very cost-efficient operations of the overall compute capacity of the EC2 service, which AWS passes all these savings and efficiencies onto you in the form of low-cost virtual machines. Now, after all this, we know that Amazon EC2 servers can provide us with cost-effective virtual machines to use. But what are other benefits to us as customers here? So with EC2, we no longer have that uh, traditional data center overhead or the pain and expense of dealing with physical servers. And we can now leverage the power of virtual machines to create virtual compute resources that match our actual workload requirements. We can request a new EC2 virtual machine, which uh, AWS calls an instance, or even thousands of new instances. Then in a matter of minutes, we have fully provisioned compute resources for us to use and immediately start to run our workloads on. 
There's no more waiting for you know weeks to order and rack and stack servers before we can use them compared to those uh, traditional IT days. Now, another key EC2 benefit is it's easy come, easy go. Just as you can simply request new EC2 instances based on uh, perhaps increases in your workload demand um, or whatever your business reasons, you can just as simply uh, stop or terminate these instances when you don't need them anymore. You're not stuck with expensive, unused physical servers when your capacity needs decrease. Now, we've touched on this a bit already in the course, and we'll be exploring billing concepts in a lot more depth later on. But with EC2, you can pick the virtual machine capacity you need, and that's what you pay for. Further, you only pay for the length of time that EC2 instance is running. As an example, if you have an EC2 instance type that is billed by the second, if you, you know, only need the instance for, say, 3 hours, 8 minutes, and uh, 21 seconds, uh, and then stop or terminate it at that point, you're only billed by AWS for just that 3 hours, 8 minutes, and 21 seconds. Then consider if you have varying compute demands for your organization, as most do. Uh, perhaps you have some type of, uh, you know, daily spikes of traffic for 2 hours each day, or perhaps on the weekend, your demand drops 90%. Think of the flexibility and cost savings a service like EC2 offers us as customers to uh, scale in and out our consumption of these EC2 instance resources exactly to our business needs. And we only pay for what we use. We're not paying for potentially hundreds of physical servers uh, sitting around idle like we would in the traditional IT environments. Now this EC2 scaling flexibility is offered in two flavors. Horizontal scaling, where we can add more of the same instance types to handle increases in our workload, or if there's uh, perhaps new application behavior or changes in the consumption ratios of uh, our needs for processing power compared to memory resources, we can also change the instance types and do what's called vertical scaling. To use an example, with vertical scaling, instead of adding four more EC2 instances, Perhaps we may be better off to change our instance type to one that has uh, four times the memory size as our original instance. We're vertically changing that single instance up or down to meet our needs rather than adding more of the same instance type with the horizontal scaling approach. Typically, horizontal scaling is the better option, but this really depends on your workload requirements and application specifics as to what the best choice would be for you. But regardless, the, the point here is that with EC2, you have this choice and freedom to scale in or out or up or down, all within the matter of minutes. Now to hammer home this flexibility benefit the EC2 service provides us, beyond all the scaling capabilities mentioned, we then have the configuration flexibility to run various Linux or Windows operating systems on them. And then we can configure a variety of storage options with instances as well. And then we have control over the networking configuration of the instances. We may want to set them up so that they're only internally accessible within our virtual private cloud network. Or we may want to set them up so that they're publicly accessible. The point I'm trying to make here is that there's endless configuration flexibility with these EC2 instances. I hope you've enjoyed this intro here on the Amazon EC2 service and learned how it may benefit you or your organization. We've just been looking at the you know, tip of the iceberg here with this core service from AWS. We'll be taking a look at more areas of EC2, like understanding the different instance types available to us, uh, automatic scaling capabilities, and the load balancing features in upcoming lessons. So with that, I'll end the lesson here, and I'll see you in the next video. Okay, so that was the Amazon EC2 service overview for you. Uh, again, this was a lesson taken from my Amazon Certified Cloud Practitioner exam course. Uh, let me know in the comments if you found it helpful, uh, if you have any suggestions, or uh, let me know what other type of content you'd like to see on the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.